Hi. In this video, I'm going to be discussing the data link layer. This happens to be layer two in the OSI model. And the data link layer is the layer which prepares network da data for the physical network. This is obviously an important layer and its role is to get the data ready to be put onto a medium. And as you can imagine, there are so many different types of protocols or mechanisms that we uh, send and receive our data. For example, satellite, fiber optic, uh, Wi-Fi or over the air, 3G, 4G communications, Ethernet. So the data link layer has to have all these protocols built in so that it can deal with all the different formats and media that we use to connect, physically connect our networks. So without further ado, this is the lecture on the data link layer. So what is the main purpose of the data link layer? Well, the, the, the two services that the data link layer provides is to allow the upper layers, the layers that are above it, it allows these layers to get access to the media. So if you want to send a message, fine. You create your communication. Remember I said that it's us that create uh, communication and that information uh, becomes seen as data. Then it gets uh, some uh, port numbering and addressing and it needs to leave our computer, needs to leave our device. And in that way, there needs to be a layer, a dedicated layer in the OSI model. That is its main function is to prepare this data to be put onto a medium. See, that's the point, is that the data link layer allows the upper layers to have access to getting onto your Ethernet cable or through the air via Wi-Fi or maybe it's cellular communications. Maybe it's uh, fiber optic. So our uh, uh, layers above do not have that uh, uh, ability, do not have protocols that are set up to get onto the media. This is why we use the data link layer. It gives us access to the media. And one of the other main services of the data link layer is to control how this data is placed onto the media and how it is received from the media using a technique which we call media access control and error detection. Remember that information is going to be leaving your device and it's also going to be coming back to your device. So if you're, let's uh, step ahead here, if you are sitting on a network and you need to get information to, to be sent to you, well obviously there has to be a layer in the OSR model that is specifically designed to get this information and get it back to you. And we have to have a, la a layer that is defined, the same layer, to take that information and put it onto the media in order to connect you to your physical devices. So I keep using the word physical. I want you to understand that the data link layer is, is concerned with physical connections. It's, a, it's, it's married to the software. So the data link layer has this uh, unique ability to take software, remember layer 7, 6, 5, 4 and 3 are all software layers and some of data link layer is also based in software but the data link layer interfaces that software into the hardware. So the hardware and the software kind of get married in this layer. So it, that's why I said it prepares the data to be put onto your media. And how it does it, it uses something called framing. And we're going to look into this in quite a bit of detail. But I want to just explain uh, something to you is that we differentiate between physical networks and logical networks. When we were on layer three, we talked in terms of logical layouts. You know, we've got IP addresses and we could have logical diagrams of networks. But when we're on layer two, this is the layer which we are concerned with how things are connected physically. Like if you went and had a look at your computer and the cabling, well, you would be looking at the data link layer and the protocols that are used in the data link layer. All right, if that doesn't make sense, it will make sense as we go on in this lecture. All right, so now we're going to come to the uh, next uh, slide here, and you can have a look at a beautiful feature of the data link layer, and that is its ability to handle various different types of um, media. And I think I've got a better uh, diagram here. Yes, here we go. If you have a look at all the different types of uh, interconnected 
uh, devices that we have along the route. Maybe you want to send a message from this computer to this computer. And if I play this little animation, we can have a look and see what happens. There comes your frame. Why it's called a frame? Because layer 2 is the layer of frames. Layer 3 is the layer of packets. So we no longer call it a packet anymore. We now call it a frame. When, when your information leaves your computer, we now call it frames. And there it goes. There goes the frame to your router. And the router is connected via a different protocol to a satellite. And then there you can see you've got a satellite uplink and downlink using a different protocol and once again back to the router and that's again a different protocol and here we coming using probably Wi-Fi and again a different protocol. So what have you noticed? The data link layer needs to be able to deal with many, many protocols and I have a list here of some of the uh, protocols which are common on the data link layer. We can see here you might be using ATM, Ethernet, we all know Ethernet, uh, Frame Relay, not as popular as it used to be, a fiber distributed data interface. This is a, a, like a token ring method. And as we go down the list, you might see some familiar protocols. Profibus, maybe you're in an industrial application, maybe uh, you're using some Siemens equipment, point to point protocol. And as we see here, various different protocols that are all built in to the data link layer. And this is not exhaustive. It means that there are other protocols which are not listed here. And there are some uh, manufacturer specific protocols obviously because they got some marketing aspect in terms of creating their own protocol and attempting to sell it with their equipment all right so getting back to the the um, data link layer and the notes now what is important is to know the terminology that is uh, used in the data link layer for example did you notice i keep using the word frame now on layer in layer two we say frames in layer three we say packets what about layer one? Well, the layer one, we say bits, bit streams. So that's the signal. But layer two, we call it a frame. And what is the frame consisting of? We call it a protocol data unit. And the reason why we call that is inside here is data. There are various protocols applied. And it's a block. So it's a, it's a single unit. Remember that we subdivide the da our data into little chunks, which then gets encapsulated as it goes down this uh, OSI layer stack, eventually coming to the data layer. So we have frames, as I've explained, and then we have nodes. A node is a device on the network. So here we have any device or intermediary that is on the network is called a node. So there we have a node, there we have a node, and if we hop again to uh, here we'll have a node so every interconnection that we have to make in order to connect our network physically we call it a node now media and this term has more than one me um, meaning but in terms of networking and specifically in terms of the data link layer media refers to the physical means used to carry data signals now i am uh, very aware that uh, the word media also means you know, TV programming or artwork or things like that. And I get that. But in terms of network communication, we, we use the word media as the interconnecting devices or links that allow us to connect, say, a computer and an IP phone. Maybe it's an Ethernet fly lead. The fly lead is called the media. And I can show you some other examples of network media. This is the Ethernet cable. And this is probably the one that most people are familiar with. And just by the way, looking at this and having a closer look, I don't know if you noticed that this is shielded. If you're looking at this RJ49, you can see the connector here has a, like an aluminium covering. Now that means that this uh, network cable here is not UTP, but STP, meaning shielded twisted pair. And just while we're on this topic, I'll have a, a, a closer look at this. What happens is it's shielded with a aluminium or foil a wrapper and there is an aluminium which or could be copper if it's a very expensive cable but there is the uh, little wire there which is supposed to connect to that shield over there in order to keep the uh, both sides of the cable at the same uh, electrical potential. So this is an, an, a media and here we have in the old days we used to use a frame relay. This is a cable there. Uh, of fiber optic there's also media and 
you know, don't forget that uh, in terms of other uh, connecting devices, there we've got RCA cable, uh, maybe a USB. So this is what we connect nodes with or we connect devices with and we call it media. So there we go, the media. Air can also be a media because we send the uh, wireless signals through the air and it can be a media and a medium. The, um, the air is the medium, but it also happens to be the media. So there is a slight differentiation with the term. Medium meaning how we send it. We send it via copper is the medium, and the media is the Ethernet cable. All right, if that's confusing, don't worry. All you need to know is the word media represents the channels or the connecting uh, physical uh, d uh, um, wires or, or connections that we use to connect our nodes. Right, moving on. A network is two or more devices connected to a common medium. So here we've got two devices, a router and a computer. So we've got this router and this computer connected via maybe an Ethernet cable. There we go. At least two devices connected together. But notice this one happens to be a wireless router and a someone's personal laptop and they connected via the air, but they are still on a network. So that's why we will still call it a network and they are talking over a common medium. All right. Now we continue having a look at an example here. I think I did show you this example and just having a look at how the frame can travel on a LAN. It can also travel over a WAN and it can also go back to the uh, um, respective network and back over to the LAN. So we see that the uh, data link layer is not something that is just in a LAN. A lot of uh, students uh, make this mistake and they assume that the data link layer is just Ethernet and it's just something that's in your small office home office and it's, um, you know, on your local network, you know, the, the switch and all the devices that are connected to it. Yes, that is a data link layer, but don't forget that there's a whole other world out there which is allowing us to connect our LANs together and that is called a WAN. So once we hop outside of the router we are now accessing a WAN and we will most probably use a different protocol. We can't use Ethernet to go over long distances because of the sheer um, uh, resist resistance in the copper medium of uh, UTP cabling. We can't go over 200 meters and obviously if you want to connect different geographic locations or different uh, um, offices together which are which span maybe in different cities you can't use ethernet ethernet is not the right protocol so what i'm trying to get across here is that the data link layer is a layer that is present in the entire network and that is why i say it is uh, present over lands and wans now at each hop along the path an intermediary device accepts the frame from one medium, decapsulates it, uh, decapsulates the frame, and then it forwards the, the packets in the new frame, and then the uh, headers of each frame are formatted for the specific medium that it will cross. So what we need to do know are these four points. Accepting the frame from the medium, decapsulating the frame into a packet. Remember that once we remove the headers and footers of the frame, we now have a packet again. Because if you look at this, let's go back here. Over here, we have a frame. But if we remove the signaling data for layer two, then we are left with what, what was there from uh, layer three, which is the packet. And if you remove the IP addresses and the headers of layer three, well then guess what? You are sitting with the uh, segment of data from layer four. So don't get confused when I say um, it decapsulates it and we left with a frame. I mean we left with a packet. Don't get confused when I say that. What I mean is that when we remove the, there it is, when I remove the header and the trailer, this is the layer two um, signaling information, we left with the layer three packet. Right, so I will uh, explain that again shortly, but I just want to carry on here and I say, so we accept the frame from a medium, we decapsulate the frame into a packet, we construct a new frame appropriate for the next 
medium. So you might be wondering why we have to decapsulate and then re-encapsulate. Remember that the signaling information for Ethernet is not the same signaling information, say, for frame relay or one of the other protocols, maybe ADSL, maybe you're using um, Wi-Fi. These are pro different protocols require different uh, signaling information or different headers and footers. And that is why we have to remove the one protocol headers and decapsulate it, leaving you with the layer three packet again. And then layer two will then recapsulate it with the next uh, relevant protocol headers and footers. It, thus constructing a new frame, which is now appropriate for the next medium, which is now useful for the next medium. Because if you're sending, say, an Ethernet frame from this satellite to this satellite, I mean, from this uh, sat, uh, antenna to this satellite, this dish to this uh, satellite, it would make no sense because it can't deal with an Ethernet protocol. You catch what I'm saying? And when it, we come to, say, over here, this, um, this uh, protocol that was used here, probably operating at the Ku or Ka band, which is very high frequency uh, bands with a very, very small wavelengths, we can't use this protocol sitting over here because our uh, portable devices cannot understand that satellite-based uh, um, protocol that we would be using over here and therefore we have to remove that signaling data and then recapsulate with say the uh, wireless uh, protocol which we will look at that's the I think the 802 standard all right so the layer two then will have to forward the packet inside with the new frame across the next segment of the physical network so can you see how the data link layer is very busy Decapture well, encapsulating, getting preparing the data, the layer three data. We're preparing it in on layer two, putting a headers on it and a footer, and then getting it ready based on the medium and the media that we use. Then, when it gets to this node, we don't need that old protocol that was used here. And when I say old, I mean one that has already been used. We're now looking at this interface on the network and saying, well, this is a different protocol, right? Put the relevant headers and uh, trailers on this uh, packet, now again called a frame, and so forth. Again and again, decapsulating, encapsulating, decapsulating, encapsulating. Right, so that is the process that is followed in the data link layer. So at each hop, the received frame is also examined for errors. So we keep in mind that the data link layer is serving us with two very important uh, features. The first one is that it is preparing the data for transmission over the network based on the various protocols that are needed. But another one is it needs to check if there were errors in that data. And that's where we come into uh, the cyclic, uh, cyclic redundancy checks and things like that. All right. Controlling transfer across the local media. Now, have a look at this animation. Here we've got some communication created. There is the layer 3 packet plus the layer 2 header and trailer. Notice, can you see that how, how the packet plus the header and uh, trailer is called a frame? Once it leaves the computer, we call it a frame. Can you see how the header and the trailer encapsulated onto the layer 3 make it a layer 2 frame? Do you see that? So it leaves the, let's start this again. It leaves the, the computer, there we go, prepared as a frame. But a fundamental thing has just happened. The layer 2 has prepared that information to be put on the um, various media. That means that the layer 2 has to understand the different devices. For example, you may have a network interface card or you might have a la uh, what do you call, ADSL connection. You may be using an old setup. Maybe you're using ISDN, which is very old. Maybe it was frame relay, just to give you an example. The data link layer must be able to understand that interface. So do you see there's a, the, an understanding of hardware? The layer 2 has to understand the hardware. So if I go ahead here, you will see that I have a, somewhere over here, I do have a picture of a network interface card. There's the network interface card. You're going to plug in your Ethernet cable into this card. 
because this is where you would normally connect to your network. That means the data link layer must understand this uh, standard, the standard of Ethernet. And if this happens to be a wireless card, like a card in normal in enabling you to access a Wi-Fi network, well, the data link layer must understand the Wi-Fi chip on board and how to prepare the data. And that means that there are different methods to get the data onto the media. So we call that MAC methods. So the media access control methods, that's why I say methods, because there are many different media that we use to access or to connect, physically connect nodes, our devices, on a network. Because there are many different devices, we call it methods. Therefore, these are defined and these processes are already uh, provided for in the uh, uh, data link layer, which allow us to receive and transmit frames in diverse network environments. And that's the point. As you can see in this uh, little animation here, here we're on a LAN. Yes, there's an Ethernet cable. And now we go to the router or the router, wherever you're from, which is a different way of calling the same word. Did you notice that? It dropped the LAN headers and it now put the WAN headers on. Why? Because it's a different protocol. This is a serial connection. A serial connection is a uh, frame relay, for example, uh, HDLC, point-to-point -point protocol. Therefore, it's a different protocol, requires a different header and trailer. So the data link layer is still the one who's responsible for it. Therefore, there's a different method for getting this information on this media, which means we have me a media access control methods. Now, a last feature of this uh, data link layer that I want to just uh, just touch on, we are going to cover it in a bit more detail later, is that the data link layer also has to determine the rules for the uh, little network. Remember that here we have more than one user. How do we deal with more than one user on a little network? And here we've got point to point. There's only two nodes, so it is point to point. While here we have two people plus a router. So there are three communicating devices here. So the data link layer also has to manage the rules that are going to be used in terms of, of who gets to transmit and how they get to transmit. So the data link layer has more than just the, the role of putting the data on the network. It also has to deal with the rules that are relevant to a certain network. Now, let's just look at a frame. What does it mean when we say we created a frame? It means that we took the layer 3 data, which is called a packet. Remember, the stuff, the little segments of information on layer 3 are called packets. It means it's got IP addresses and so forth. It gets encapsulated. Encapsulated means it gets a header put on and a trailer put on. What is the header? The header contains the respective information for the various protocol we're using on that uh, on that network. If you're using Ethernet, you're going to have an Ethernet header, which means you're going to have a MAC address and so forth, and a trailer. If we're using a, a different protocol, maybe we're using HDLC, you'll have a header that has the signaling information for that protocol, HDLC. But also, the, uh, net, the data link layer will also have to abide by rules according to the protocol. Like the rule for Ethernet is called CSMACD. That is an Ethernet-based rule, which I will cover shortly. So the data link layer creates this frame. It needs to know which nodes are in, a com are in communication with each other because of the rules. Remember, if there are many nodes communicating with each other, we have to apply different rules. So it needs to know which nodes are in communication with each other, when communication between individual nodes begins or ends. It also needs to know which errors occurred while the nodes communicated. Why? Because if there was an error, maybe you have to retransmit your frame. And it also needs to know which nodes will communicate next. Why? Because it mustn't transmit at the same time when someone else 
is transmitting. So this is the uh, control information which helps the data link layer manage the what I call turn taking rules. Who gets a turn to transmit on the network? Now in order to do this, the data link layer has to have a header and a trailer. And what is the header? It contains the control information such as the addressing and so forth. It also contains the trailer, and this is also to do with the error correction and when the frame stops. Remember that this is a bunch of bits. A frame consists of ones and zeros because computers speak binary. They don't speak English. They don't speak other languages. They literally speak ones and zeros. So how do we differentiate the um, large portion of ones and zeros that are on a network? How do we know that the this frame starts here. Maybe I've got another slide here too. Yes. How do we know that this frame starts here? Otherwise, these frames would just run into each other and we wouldn't be able to differentiate the start and the end. So that is one of the purpose, purposes of the header and the trailer is it allows us to know when to start, when we to acknowledge the start of a frame and when to acknowledge the end of a frame. So there's a certain bit pattern, meaning that the device, maybe it's, let's, let's uh, see if I can pick up a device here. Here we go, a network interface card. So the, the network interface card is looking for a certain bit pattern, meaning the software here, once it comes through into this uh, uh, coupler here, and then it's obviously amplified and, and so forth, and then uh, maybe it comes to this uh, controller here, this ICU, the ICU, the software in the ICU is, is counting bits and looking for a bit pattern. So that bit pattern says, all right, I've, I've noticed the, that, sorry, that bit pattern tells the, the device that I'm the beginning of the frame. Yes, I, this bit pattern represents the beginning of a frame. Here I am, 1010. And then the software in the data link layer knows to say, right, start counting the bits from there and everything afterwards will be the various protocol protocol header details for example this happens to have an address and a type a type control information then it knows after that that's just data which means the data link layer will ignore this whole section here because that was represents the layer 3 data and remember the whole point of the OSI is that the other layers do not need to care what they are, the, the, they are doing. So layer 2 does not need to concern itself with what layer 3 does. Layer 2 works almost independently. So it will just ignore this whole section here because that's for layer 3. But it knows to count a certain amount of bits and see, all right, I'm now at the the final point, I've noticed this bit pattern and that bit pattern according to my set of rules, according to my protocol that I'm using, according to the uh, device that I'm, I'm connected to, you happen to be using Ethernet in this example, Ethernet knows it's looking for a certain bit pattern, right, boom, picked up the bit pattern and it says, okay, acknowledge the bits before this uh, final sequence and that will be the error detection bit pattern. And it'll use that to determine if the data was corrupt or not corrupt. Okay, so let me say that one more time in summary. The data link layer takes the information from layer 3 and puts headers and trailers on. The header and the trailer represent the headers and trailers for a certain protocol. It's not always Ethernet. It could be any layer 2 protocol. As I've said, there are many layer 2 protocols. If we are on a LAN and it's an Ethernet LAN, well then fine. The header happens to be a Ethernet header and the trailer will then be representing Ethernet signaling information. It takes this and it uses that um, and puts it on to a physical media. That's the physical layer. It gives it to the physical layer. It's all prepared and ready for the physical layer so it means that the data link layer needs to know the protocol that is being used. Are we using Ethernet? 
Are we using point-to-point -point protocol? Are we using ADSL? Because the, it would need to put those correct headers and trailers on that packet. Once the headers and trailers are on the packet or encapsulated on the packet, it gets ready to be put onto the media. The media could be many different types. It could be wire media, copper, it could be glass, fiber optic, it could be air, could even be in water. We've got sonar, we've got other protocols as well. It could be um, through the air, Wi-Fi, it could be GSM. So the various uh, protocols need to be identified in the data link layer who's in charge of all this framing of packets remember that we are creating a frame and think about what is a frame just to just to 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 uh, make this quite simple let me just show you something a picture frame can you see how what the the representation of a frame is it's taking something and putting something else around it so that's why I'm framing the, the, the data. Do you see that? So that's the point of the word frame. I'm framing the packet. I'm putting something around it, a header and a trailer. And I'm getting it ready to be sent over the network. So the trailer provides control information. Remember that the device that is supposed to absorb this information. Here we've got this uh, network interface card. The device that is supposed to understand this information needs to know when the information has started and when it ended, and when the next frame starts, and when the next frame ends, and when the next frame starts and next. So we call that um, creating a frame. And in order to do that, we need start uh, frame start sequences, frame stop sequences. We need an error detection method, and we also will need an address because we need to be sending this to someone. All right, so I hope this is making sense. Um, the data traveling on the media is converted into a stream of bits. There comes the stream of bits. Woo! And these bits are, are literally ones and zeros. And as the node, the node could be a router, it could be you, it could be um, a, a, a Ethernet switch, it could be a hub. As the, the, uh, the media... As the node receives this long stream of bits, it needs to determine where's the start frame, where, where's the start of this frame, and where's the end of this. And that is why we need something called control information. And this is one of the reasons why the data link layer has to put these extra bits, I mean uh, extra headers and trailers on the packet. One for addressing, because it needs to be sent on a network. And, and the second one is to tell the device when we, the packet starts, when it ends, and some error correction. Remember that now we are transmitting. And when we transmit and receive, we often send it over hostile environments. Um, just imagine uh, transmitting right into space. Here we had a picture here earlier. You're sending your information right into space. This is a hostile environment. We will lose some of these frames, there will be uh, cloud cover, there could be solar radiation. There's lots of reasons why frames go um, corrupt. And that is why we need a lot of error correction. And that is why it's happening on the data link layer. Because it's the data link layer that is dealing with the ones and zeros. Right. Now, to connect us, the data link layer, to connect us to our networks, we have a hardware we have hardware. There we go. There's a network interface card. And I've got some better uh, images there because I know that nowadays we don't uh, really use uh, uh, standalone network interface cards like we used to. So here I've got a, a, a nice looking motherboard. And if you scroll down, you'll see there is what they're calling a killer gigabit Ethernet LAN. So the standalone network card is not that common anymore. What is common are uh, onboard uh, connectivity devices. So here we see there's the gigabit Ethernet. It will then just be wired, the pinouts, so we'll see the wires will go down here. And somewhere on this motherboard, you will find the gigabit LAN, um, a little uh, ICU, which will, uh, which will processor, which will deal with this um, a protocol called Ethernet. So we can see that the uh, our motherboards have changed and here you see you've got even two um, LAN connections, Ethernet LAN. And somewhere here you'll probably have your Intel 
uh, gigabit uh, connection or other various um, um, manufacturers who also do uh, Ethernet micro chips for dealing with layer 2 protocols. Now, what happens if your motherboard had a, maybe it had a wireless connection? Then you might find that you have a slot for a wireless card. Maybe it's even, there we go, maybe you've got a, a you could put a Wi-Fi card there. Let's have a look at a Wi-Fi card. Uh, there we go. So you could maybe install a Wi-Fi card onto your motherboard if it didn't have one and you can make, there we go, there's a very good example. And there's the antenna. Can you see there's the Wi-Fi card? There are the um, uh, little cables here, the coaxial cable, and then you would have your antennas connected to that point over there. And the point I'm trying to make is there are many ways to, again, the, uh, the Wi-Fi, there are many ways to get access onto a network. You might go via copper, which is the um, Ethernet, there we go, or you might be using Wi-Fi, for example. You might even use be using uh, cellular, 3G. The point I'm trying to make here is it's the data link layer that will deal with the fact that now you are using Wi-Fi and st instead of Ethernet. And therefore, it has to prepare the information that is coming out of this computer and get it onto this. You can see there is your wireless controller and get it onto the wireless controller and there it will come. The ones and zeros will now be transmitted over the air through this, this, these two antennas. Maybe you are connecting via Ethernet. Well, the, uh, while the, the Ethernet controller on board here, it'll be an onboard one, will get the ones and zeros ready to be transmitted over copper in this case. And on some motherboards, we'll even see a fiber optic connection to uh, connect you over a network, maybe using fiber. Now, as I've said several times, the data link layer marries the software with the hardware. We can sort of think about the data la uh, link layer as two sub layers. Because if you look at it, half of it, let's just uh, be simplistic here, half of the data link layer has to deal with all the requirements that are um, requested from above, the software aspects. But the other half of the data link layer is to deal with the hardware aspects. So we could think about the data link layer as being subdivided into two. The one side dealing with the software and the one other side dealing with the physical, the, 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 uh, the aspects that are, are dealt with in terms of hardware. So if you think about the data link layer as having two separate uh, subdivisions um, or two subdivisions, then you could see that the uh, two features of the data link layer could be understood separately. Now, we call these the logic link controller, the logic link control, LLC, and the media access control. Now, think about this. Let's just uh, deal with the language, the English. Now, I know a lot of you watching the video do not have English as a first language. <clears throat> do you recall that layer three was to do with logical things. IP addresses are based on logic. So that is why it says logical link control. It links the logical aspects of the, the layer above to the physical aspects. Do you get that? So logical link. The, da the data link layer acts as a link linking the logical, the software aspects from the uh, layer above to the physical so it allows the logical aspects to have access to a media. So that means that the logic link controller or logic link control places the information in the frame. This is the definition, by the way. The logic link control places information in the frame that identifies which network layer protocol is being used for the frame. This information allows multiple layer 3 protocols uh, such as IP version 4, IP version 6 to utilize the same network interface media. So what does that mean? What I'm trying to explain here is that if we look at the layer above here, this is the layer of IP. Now layer of IP needs an opportunity to get, <laughs> you know, your, your, your packets need an opportunity to get out of the network, needs to leave the network through this port here. So the logic link controller allows the layer 3 packets the ability 
to be framed according to whatever protocol layer 2 is going to be using. So it provides the link from layer 3 to layer 2 by identifying which network layer is being used for the frame. So the logical link control allows for something called multiplexing of protocols. Because many protocols exist or, or can exist on the data link layer, so it must have the ability to multiplex and allow different protocols to coexist. For example, as I said earlier, we might have um, IP packets coming through to the data link layer, but then the data link layer must be able to have the uh, option of sending it via Ethernet, via a wireless LAN, maybe point-to-point -point protocol, maybe HDLC, maybe X25. So these protocols can coexist. That means that the logical link control also allows for multiplexing. So it, uh, in, in, in to, to recap, the logical link control places the information in the frame and identifies the network layer protocol that must be used for this frame. So it has to know, okay, I'm on an Ethernet network, therefore I'm taking my layer 3 logical uh, packets, my, my layer 3 packets, and I'm going to prepare them using Ethernet framing. Or it'll say, I'm on a wireless LAN network, so I'm going to take my packets and frame them according to uh, the IEEE maybe 802 standard, because that's the wireless LAN standard. All right, so we've done that top sub-layer of the uh, data link layer. Now, the second layer or sub-layer of the data link layer is called media access control. Once we've got the protocol ready and the frame created, somebody has to manage the, the um, signaling, the addressing, and the starting and stopping of the data. And we call this the physical signaling requirements of the medium. So the media access control provides data link layer addressing and delimiting. The word delimiting means that when to stop. So this is the definition. The media access control provides data link layer addressing and delimiting of data according to the physical signaling requirements of the medium and the type of data link layer protocol in use. So can you see that while these are two sub layers, they do need to work hand in hand because if we are using wireless LAN, the media access control will have to uh, be very active because there was a lot of errors on a wireless network. Therefore, it will have to deal with all those errors based on the protocol that the logic link control has uh, prepared. The logic link, logical link control said we, we're sending this information by wireless LAN. Okay, fine. So the media access control has to get all prepared in terms of how to manage the uh, error, uh, the, the addressing and the stopping of the data, starting and stopping. So if we look at the summary here, a packet is encapsulated into a frame. The data link layer can be seen as two sub-layers. Logic link con uh, control, which is frames the network layer packet, identifies the protocol. Remember, this is a multiplexing function because many protocols can coexist on the data link layer. And I just want to uh, demonstrate how powerful that is. Here I have the network. Now watch here. I'm going to switch my Wi-Fi on. Um, let's put the Wi-Fi on. There we go. Now the Wi-Fi is now on. Now I can go and immediately unplug my network card and my, my Ethernet cable. So I'm going to go and unplug my network cable right now. And I've unplugged my network cable now. And look, immediately I've now connected to a wireless network. There it is. I've now connected to a wireless network. And watch how quick, if I plug in my if I plug in my Ethernet cable, it means I'm changing protocol because this is wireless LAN. I'm currently on a wireless LAN. Now I'm going to plug in my network cable again. And I've just plugged in the cable and now I can disconnect. I can switch off the Wi-Fi and boom, I'm now connecting 
to the network via different protocols. So that's how quick the data link layer responds and it can allow this to be multiplexed. You may even sub, uh, transmit over two um, um, uh, you may even transmit over two interfaces at once. So that's why I'm saying to you about the multiplexing function. All right, now we come to the media access control. This is addressing the frame. Remember that each type of protocol, each protocol you use, whether it's Ethernet or wireless LAN, requires an address, an addressing system. Therefore, um, we need to have a uh, part of the uh, data link layer which is going to manage the addressing you know who are we sending our information to and who does it come from so addressing the frame and then we need something for marking the beginning and ending of the frame and that is the job of the media access control the mac now there are various different standards that uh, are linked to the data link layer for example if you are using ieee that is the International, uh, sorry, that is the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, IEEE, and that's uh, the organization who uh, have the standards for Ethernet, there's wireless LAN, and there's logic link controller, and maybe you're using high level data link control. Well, that happens to be uh, a standard from the International Telecommunication Union, ITU, and maybe you're using ISO which is the International Organization for Standardization. So what I'm trying to put forward here to you is that these are mostly uh, standards that are related to the data link layer, mostly from journals and research papers that people and or organize, uh, companies have, have done and published, like Ethernet, Token Ring, Wireless LAN. So you can look these up and you can study these standards based on these different organizations, ISO, uh, or, or IEEE, NC is another one, American National Standards Institute, and so forth. Once the logical link control has framed the layer 3 packet, it is now ready to be placed on the media. This is the media access control feature function. So remember I said to you that the data link layer could be subdivided into two further layers. Well, the logical link control, but now we're talking about the media access control. And the media access control has different techniques for doing its job. And these techniques or these methods are based on the media sharing, how many nodes are on the uh, network, and also the topology, how the connection between the nodes appears to the data link layer. Is it... Uh, a ring topology, for example, let me just show you what I'm talking about about topologies. Are the lay layouts like this, point to point? Is it multiple access like this? Maybe it's in a ring like that. So that will also determine what um, methodology the media access control will employ in this uh, different uh, scenario. So here we go. Let's look at the option of no control. No control at all would result in many collisions. And we, as we know, when there are collisions, data is corrupted, and we first of all have to deal with the corrupted information, which usually means resending the information, and that then uh, reduces throughput, and we also have some uh, delays, because we have to wait for the communication channel to be cleared in order for uh, the next node to transmit. So if there, are no, if there is no control and we simply put the data on the, the uh, media, we will have collisions. So there has to be some sort of rules or methods or turn-taking rules so that the frames do not um, get uh, um, corrupted along the route. For example, there are methods that enforce a high degree of control, but then there's a lot of overhead because in those methods, there's a lot of overhead in terms of whose turn it is. So frame one, I mean, uh, node one sends a frame, then a pause, then we know that node two is allowed to send a frame, then there's a pause, then we know that frame three is allowed to send a frame, then there's a pause. So you can see that although it is very reliable and that the uh, there are few collisions, these turn-taking rules slow down the throughput or reduce the throughput because what happens if the turns are one, two, and three, but 
node 2 does not need to send anything. So then we'll have node 1 sending something, node 2 will, we will wait for node 2, nothing will be sent, and then node 3 is allowed access to the channel and then it will send. So we can see that if there are people who do not need to send their data, we are now wasting time if we have a high degree of control. And also, I don't know if you noticed, that if we have turn-taking rules that are very deterministic, deterministic means they're very well defined, like node 1 is allowed to transmit, thereafter node 2 is allowed to transmit, thereafter node 3. This uh, signaling information has to be put into the headers, meaning the rules of the, of the um, turn-taking rules have to be put in the headers, and the additional overhead also reduces the good put. Now remember, in earlier videos I showed you, I described the difference between throughput and good put. Throughput is how much data or just bits get through the network. Good put is how much of that data is useful. Remember, overhead like headers and error correction information is not useful to the end user. Yes, it's useful to the OSI layers in terms of signaling and making sure the, the um, transmission is reliable, but the end user doesn't understand that. I mean, I just want to get my data. I just want to stream my YouTube video, for example. So if there's a lot of overhead, a lot of signaling information, it does um, uh, reduce the good put. All right, so to sum up, the Mac is in charge of the getting the data onto the channel and the rules which are at play in terms of who can communicate and how we deal with these collisions. Mac did, makes this decision based on the media sharing, how the nodes share the media. It also makes this decision based on the topology, how the nodes are connected to each other. Because depending on how the nodes are connected to each other will also depend on the rules which are at play. Now, let's have a look at two different uh, methodologies. We've got controlled access for shared media. Shared media means there's many people who are on this little communication channel. So shared means that it is not one-to-one. -one. So here, I just want to show you again, this is one-to-one. -one. That's not, uh, we don't really consider that shared because that is one-to-one. -one. Here, we see a few people can access the channel. Maybe there was two or three more computers here or two or three more nodes here that would uh, it give a better example of shared, but we've got three here and three means it's shared. Now, look what they're saying. We need rules for how to share the media because what happens if this person wants to transmit at the same time this person wants to transmit? So we need to set up some rules. Now, in terms of controlled access, we have deterministic rules. There's the word deterministic, which means that the nodes on the network know when they are allowed to transmit and they know when they have to wait. So in, in saying that, it's determined. That's what the word deterministic means. It means it's already been decided for you. You can't choose. It's been decided for you. So that's why I mean, why, why I use the word deterministic. And I've told you about the challenges with this is it does reduce the throughput because in order to create that decision, everybody on this shared network needs to know the rules and therefore those rules need to be sent to everyone. And therefore, if they're sent to everyone, it's using the channel for signaling information rather than data. All right. The other option is called contention-based access for shared media. Now, in contention-based access for shared media, we have the ability to listen. We, what happens here is we first listen on the channel. Now, I'll just show you contention-based. We see here, I try to send when I am ready. I need to listen. See, stations can transmit at any time. Collisions do exist. Here, this person is saying, I try to send when I'm ready. I try to send when I am ready. So what does that mean? It means that anybody can transmit when they want to. However, we've got two subdivisions. We've got collision detection and collision avoidance. I will explain those two terms now. I just want to go uh, back to controlled and just show you the difference here. Controlled, the first version I told you about, the deterministic version, 
Here we have, I have a packet to send, but it's not my turn. I will wait. He's not listening to the channel. If the channel is empty and nobody's transmitting, but he wants to transmit, there's nothing he can do. He's not allowed to. This person is um, saying, I have nothing to send. So it, maybe it's his turn, but he's got nothing to send. So everybody has to wait. Yet this person here is not sending anything. And let's look at this person here. She is saying, my turn to send, I will now send now. She had to wait for this person's um, time uh, uh, option. This person didn't, take, uh, uh, didn't need to send, so didn't take advantage of the channel. But everybody had to wait that time interval. And then this person can send. So you can see that we don't use the channel efficiently. Now, here's the summary. Only one station transmits at a time. So therefore, we have less collisions, which is great. Devices wishing to transmit must wait their turn. No collisions, as I said. Some deterministic networks use token passing. That just means that a token flies around the network. When I say token, it's just a packet of, uh, it's just a, a block of bits that when you receive the bits, it's telling your computer, your data link layer, you now may transmit. It's almost like passing a microphone. I'll give you the microphone, you can speak, right? When you're done, you pass it to the next person, you can speak. But imagine the microphone had to go from the person sitting in the front right-hand side all the way in the front row to the next person. And the next person didn't have anything to say, right? Then they're going to pass it to the next person. Then I don't have anything to say. And they're going to pass it to the next person. Then the next person saying, okay, I do have something to say. Then I pass it to the next person. No, well, I don't have anything to say. So you can see that everybody gets a turn, but some people don't need a turn, right? Examples of this are token ring, and FDDI. Now, let's look at contention-based. Contention-based says stations can transmit at any time. Hey, I'm ready to send. I'm also ready to send. So you can send. Collisions exist because think about it. This guy's ready to send and this guy ready to send at the same time. They don't know that they're each ready to send. They both try and send from, uh, their, their frames. And guess what? There's a collision. So collisions do exist. Mechanisms exist to resolve these uh, problems. So we've got two mechanisms that we'll cover in this course, and that is CSMACD and CSMACA. So let me just tell you what that stands for. Carrier Sensed Multiple Access Collision Detection. Or CSMACA. Carrier Sense Multiple Access Collision Avoidance. The difference between these two is that the collision detect is for Ethernet networks and collision avoidance is wireless. They're slightly different and I will give examples of how these two are different. Now, how this um, contention-based access for shared media works is that when we talk about CSMA, which is um, carrier uh, sensed multiple access where we're coming to it now let's see here let's have a look at it here uh, carrier sense multiple access okay it's not there let's see here not there okay it's not showing in the picture here but I'll just uh, describe it what happens is this is the communication channel and if somebody is busy using the channel there would be signaling information that means there would be a voltage present on the Wire, copper wire, for example, or if it was an optical network, maybe fiber optic, there would be um, light impulses. So if you can see the channel or if you can hear the channel is busy, then you don't transmit. That's what CSMA, collision detection, means. It means you listen first. You listen. Is the channel empty? Is there a carrier signal running on that channel? No, there's no carrier signal, so you may transmit. That's what CSMA stands for. There it says, a protocol in which a node wishing to transmit listens for a carrier wave before trying to send. If a carrier is sensed, the node waits for a transmission in progress to finish before initiating its own transmission. It means that he listens. Is there a carrier wave? A carrier wave is a wave that you normally use to um, modulate a signal. So if, uh, if we're talking about frequency division multiplexing, then we would put our data onto a carrier wave in order to get the data up to a high rate, uh, a high bit rate, for example. So we put it onto a foster um, a wave and that's called a carrier. 
So we have, a, we have a carrier wave present here, which means that this person cannot transmit because he can listen. He can say, oh, I hear there's something there on the line. And when I say here, it means I can detect a voltage or I can detect light rays. That's what it means. So uh, he, he listens for it. The, the, the communication channel is busy. He waits. Once he hears nothing, the channel is empty, he may transmit. However, there may be a collision because somebody else over here, she may also be waiting. And then as soon as the channel goes dead because this person is finished transmitting, th this person here and this person here attempt to transmit at the same time and boom, collision. So I will discuss that shortly. And we call that a data collision. When two people try to transmit at the same time. And what a data collision means, if we define it, it's when two stations, but it may even be three, by the way, when two or more stations transmit at the same time on a multiple access topology. Topology means a layout or a network. So we say when two stations transmit at the same time on a shared network and the frames of both the sending stations collide with each other and they alter the original frame creating fragments. You might be wondering that why how I'm sorry you might be wondering how somebody's um, data can interfere with another person's data. Now think about this if I transmit a one a one meaning a binary one is let's call it five volts and this person's first bit happens to be a zero. What happens when you have a five volt and a zero on the same channel? Well five volts earthed because a zero is zero volts so five volts on a channel when this here is zero it almost brings this guy's one uh, uh, one uh, binary, binary one or five volt to a lower voltage potential so it'll convert this one to a zero so if i've got a zero here and a one here well guess what i've now got a zero and a zero because the zero will earth this guy's uh, five volts um, if that doesn't make sense, don't worry. The point is, is if you've got two packets on a network and they collide, uh, we have fragmentation and the packets then become useless. Now, let's just look at MAC access control for non-shared media. Now, just to recap, this is shared. Can you see there's more than two nodes here? And this is not shared. Remember, it's one to one. That means his transmit port is connected to his receive port. There's nobody else on the network. So he can just transmit at any point in time. You can say, I'm transmitting now. And then nobody else can also transmit because his transmit pin is connected to his receive pin. Can you see that these two computers are connected directly to each other? That means we've used something called a crossover cable. And just to show you what that looks like, if we look at a crossover cable, if we look at the crossover cable, can you see that the transmit color is swapped to the receive color? So on the one side, and say on the PC, PC there, let's say we've got a PC and another uh, node, a hub or another PC. Can you see that it was transmit one, transmit two, but look what happened on the other side. His transmit uh, one and his transmit two got swapped to receive one and receive two. So transmit goes to receive on the other node and his transmit two goes to receive on the other node while his receive goes to transmit and his receive goes to transmit. So there's no sharing. There's nobody else who can access this little copper wire. So therefore, when we look at this uh, layout, this is, imagine, an Ethernet cable plugged into the back of this PC and an Ethernet cable plugged into the back of that PC crossovered, crossed over, sorry, not crossovered, please. It's crossed over. So therefore, there's no option for a collision. Why? Because transmit is wired to receive. There's no collision because the, 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 the transmit here is, is wired to the receive here and the receive here is wired to the transmit here and the transmit here is wired to the receive here. So those channels are always open. He can transmit when he wants to and nobody else can transmit because he's the only one who's got the transmit line and he's the only one who's got the transmit line on this side and they happen to be different, different lines. Look, this transmit line is different to this transmit line so there cannot be a collision. So here we see media access control for non-shared media. It means one-to-one. -one. Think about two routers connected to each other. That is a non-shared media. So there is no uh, problem. We don't have a uh, collision problem. 
Therefore, we can reduce the overhead. Why do I say we can reduce the overhead? Because we don't need to have the turn-taking rules because he can transmit when he wants because he's got access to the transmit wire and he's got access to, the, to, the, to his transmit wire. However, in such a situation, we do have something called half duplex and full duplex. And that just means that uh, depending on the buffering of the network interface cards, when I say buffering, I mean the memory available, are the cards of a newer generation that can transmit and receive at the same time. Now, nowadays, this is a standard. Every, every uh, node can transmit and receive at the same time. Uh, when I say node uh, and every, I mean wired node. Wireless, it's a little bit different. In wired nodes, when I say wired, I mean you've plugged in the one side and you've plugged in the other side. So this is when I say full, I mean this is when I say wired. So in a wired network, whether it's fiber optic cable or copper cable, when I say uh, wired, I mean cable to cable, uh, point to point, then we ask ourselves, can I transmit and receive at the same time? So what I'm asking you is, can I, on this side of the, uh, of the, of the little network, on this PC, is my network card good enough to transmit and deal with packets coming from on the receiving line at the same time. So that's just got to do with the memory of the network interface card and the CP, like the, the processing power. Nowadays, almost all switches and uh, network interface cards can do this. But in the older days, they couldn't. So we called it half duplex. So here we have an example of half duplex. Half duplex means the node can only do one thing at a time. So he's going to transmit. Once he's finished transmitting, then and only then is his network card able to listen to the receiving uh, channel. Now, still, this does not have anything to do with collisions, by the way. Be this just has to do with whether the data can be transmitted and received at the same time. It's got to do with um, throughput and the rate at which the data can be sent and received on an, in a network. So if I can only transmit and I cannot receive at the same time, you can see it's going to take me more time to get my uh, message and receive information because I have to transmit, wait, I have to transmit and wait until the transmission is finished until I can receive. So we call that half duplex. Wait until this frame is received before sending the next one. Uh, now, full duplex means that we're operating with a newer network and the switch or the network interface card on the computer is um, strong enough. When I say strong, I mean has enough processing power to send and deal with the uh, receive packets at the same time. So it's really to do with processing power. Okay, so half duplex, one thing at a time. Either you're sending or you're receiving. Full duplex means you're sending and receiving at the same time. Now, on this uh, slide, you can see that I've got three different logical topologies. What that means is that it's three different ways of seeing a network. And I'm using the word seeing because here we have a node and another node. And logically, they are connected to each other. And we call that point to point. On this, in this diagram, I have multi-access shared medium here. And you can see that the way it is set out. And here we've got another logical option here called ring. Now, why I'm using the word logical is it's the way we see the network. Can you see that this guy is connected to that and that guy is connected to that? And it makes sense because it tells us, okay, this computer is uh, um, connected to that and connected to that. It's fine. It shows us a logical diagram. But in real life, if you had to go and inspect these networks, you will see that they don't look exactly like this. Physically, how are they connected? They might be connected a little bit differently. For example, this just shows a wire connected, to, like a line touching a line, a line touching a line. How do you do that in real life? Well, you must have another device because we can't just put all the copper wires together. It doesn't work that way. We have to have places to plug things in. And look at this. We can't just have a line going 
on the PC. So that's, that's like assuming that you can just put a cable and rest it on a computer. No. So logically, it gives you the idea of the layout. It's the logical layout. It's, it's the logic you've used in terms of how you set up your network. Okay, I've used a multiple access, a multi-access network. So you draw it like this. But in real life, there must be some other device here. There might be a hub, a network hub. Um, and, and what about here? There are obviously network interface cards that allow me to connect going into the, the, um, the, co the uh, computer and one going out and going in and one going out. So we can see there is a slight difference. Well, not a slight difference. There is a difference between a physical topology and a logical topology. And this is defined as the uh, physical topology as the arrangement of nodes and the physical connections between them. So when we're talking about a physical topology, we want to talk about the, the, the cables, the computers, and the peripherals, the actual components. Physical means you can see and touch it. So we'll talk about the network interface cards, the hubs, the switches, the routers, the ports, the cabling. When we're talking about a logical topology, well, that's a bit different. If you look at that, you will see this is a map. It's almost like something that's based on your logic. It's like a design aspect. A map of devices on a network and how they communicate with one another. It shows the flow of data on a network, but it doesn't always show you the physical aspects. Like, we're not going to see here the intermediary devices. Or even here, this is a point-to-point -point network. But guess what? A point-to-point -point network may also be um, going, well, most probably will go through the cloud. What's happening all in here? Well, we're not seeing that. There's probably at least uh, 12 or 13 routers that are inside here in order to connect this ISP or internet service provider or, or, or company to this company, but we don't show it because that's a logical diagram. A physical diagram, on the other hand, will, will, will be almost like for the, for the engineer or the person who's got to cable it themselves. And, and they'll even have the port numberings and the type of cabling and the lengths and the, um, the, the, the specifications of the cabling. Is it CAT5? Is it CAT6? And so forth. Okay, so I think we've exhausted that. And this will be discussed again on the chapter on Ethernet if you want more information on physical and logical topologies. Okay, so just looking at the point-to-point -point topology from a logical uh, viewpoint, here we see we've got node 1 and node 2. But keep in mind that, as I've said, inside here there might be additional hops. And if you wanted to see the physical connections, well, you'll see there are other routers and intermediary devices. So whether I show them or not, as you can see, I'm showing them and I'm removing them, it doesn't change the characteristics of the logical network. Uh, this lady here is still, the person here is still sending a message to the person here. So source address, destination address, they're not seeing all this stuff in the middle. So in terms of the logical layout, it's literally node to node. But in terms of the physical aspects, well, this lady here will be sending via many hops to get to this person, this lady over here, in terms of send, uh, receiving her messages. All right, moving on. If we have a look at the logical viewpoint of multi-access topology, we can now see a summary of carrier sense multiple access collision detection. What happens is A is saying I need to transmit something to E and look what it says. I first check for other transmissions. He's listened to the line. There was no carrier wave. There was no voltage or signals detected. So he can now transmit a message to E. Now he's trying to transmit to E, but guess what? This is a shared media, medium, a uh, network. So look at this. Everybody gets the frame. Only E will respond to it. But look here. At the same time, B also wants to send um, information, but B wants to send to D. So look, B is saying, I also need to transmit, but there is still a frame present on the channel. So look what happens. B listens. And says, ah, I can, I can sense or measure a carrier voltage or a carrier signal. So I will have to wait. This is an example of collision detection. The channel is now empty. The transmission detected. So it will wait. And now B 
can now send uh, his wave to D because the channel is empty. There comes his frame. Everybody gets it because it's a shared network and only D will, will or should respond to it. And that gives you an example of how the carrier sense multiple access collision detection works. Now, moving on, just having a look very briefly at the ring topology, which is not as popular anymore, used to be popular. All that happens is that um, we have a token that has to move around a network. And he says he wants to send something, and look what happens. The frame, is it for me? No. Is it for me? No. Is it for me? Yes. Now, what about this token? I said a token. Why is it that A can transmit and nobody else can? Well, because A is sitting with a token. When A is finished, he'll pass the token on to B, and then B will say, oh, okay, I can transmit now, and I will send my transmissions. And then guess what? Um, the, the packets will still, the frames will still go around the network. So that's called the logical ring topology. Now, just having a look at the protocols, which is very important, we have fragile environments and protected environments. Now, one of the features of the data link layer is error correction. And the reason why is because, as I said earlier in, the, in this lecture, is that sometimes we have to send things over um, very fragile environments, long distances. Um, there might be interferences in terms of uh, you know, environmental aspects, uh, outages, power outages, overloading in terms of um, you know, network uh, usage. Maybe it's overloaded and the, the, uh, the throughput goes down and the transmission rate has to go down and therefore we lose some packets because too much was sent and not all of them were received. While if we compare that to a protected environment, here we may be looking at a LAN, uh, an Ethernet network. So we can see that there are different networks, and this might be a this is probably a WAN, while this might be a LAN. So in terms of the data link layer, we have different protocols to deal with the different uh, layouts, whether it is a fragile network or protected network. Now, if it's a fragile network, we need more controls, and as I said, more controls uh, relate to larger fields, meaning headers and trailers to deal with the control of the information. While if it's protected and we don't anticipate much um, uh, collisions or, uh, or, or loss of data, well, then we don't need as much control uh, and signaling information. Therefore, we can have large, uh, fewer uh, controls and therefore more throughput. Now, in terms of the header, now I did say that there is a header that goes on or gets encapsulated onto the packet. Remember, the packet three, uh, um, uh, sorry, sorry. I remember I said the packet comes from layer three down to layer two, and layer two frames it. Remember, put a frame around it, and that frame consists of a header and a trailer. And those headers and trailers are linked to the various protocols. So if we're using Ethernet, it's got its Ethernet type of header. If we are using uh, HDLC, it will have the HDLC type of header and so forth in terms of the trailer. Now, each one of these things is very important. As I showed earlier, we have a start frame. This is the field that tells other devices on the network that a frame is coming along the medium. And it also tells the device when the frame um, starts so that the device, when it does receive it, knows the beginning of the frame. And then we've got the address. We always have to have an address because otherwise, how would we know where the packet is going? I mean, the frame is going. So this has the source and the destination address on inside the header. And then we've got the type and length. This is the uh, a field that some protocols use to tell the type of the data that is coming and possibly the length of the frame. Now, in terms of the uh, frame check sequence and the stop frame, we won't look at that now because we are now dealing with the header. The header means it's in front. Like your, your, in terms of a, a, if you look at a Word document, we have something called headers and footers. The header part of the Word document is the top section. So I'll show you here. If you look at a Word document, this part here, as you can see, it now says header. 
It's on the head of the document. And look here, this is at the back or the end. It's called the footer. So that is the footer of the document. Now, in terms of the uh, framed packet, same story. This is the header of the frame. And this is the foot, uh, the um, trailer. Well, and I called it the footer, but the trailer of the frame. Footer meaning the thing at the end. Right. So what do these things do? These are the control and signaling information that we need in order to know what to do with this frame. Some things would, would be important like priority or quality of service field indicates the type of communication in terms of what processing must be applied. Is this data more important than other data? Is it voice data that needs to be uh, prioritized over, say, email data? And uh, there are quite a few aspects in terms of header and, and, and things like that, which you can have a look at. And I'm not going to go through all of those right now, but I will just show you there are uh, some aspects. Start of the frame, the source and destination address field, uh, priority type field, logical connection control field, uh, physical link control field, flow control field used to uh, start and stop traffic, congestion control field. So we can see that different protocols are going to have different aspects in there or different parts of their header. Now, here we see uh, the, the uh, diagram here showing where the frame goes. Now, this means we need to have an address system because the frame is needing to go somewhere. It needs to be addressed to somebody or some, you know, some uh, device on the network. Now, the addresses are used locally. I don't know if you can see here that between these nodes, these addresses make sense. <clears throat> so, a lot of people get confused between a physical address and a logical address. A logical address will be the IP addresses, for example. But a physical address is the address of the actual host physically connected or physically interfaced to a local network. So there is a difference there. Because we're dealing with the um, data link layer, this is the layer to do with physical aspects. So we have physical addresses. And in terms of Ethernet, for example, we have a MAC address. That is a, an address that is burned into the network interface card. You may not change that address. That is the um, address that is given to the network interface card from the manufacturer. That is a physical address and it only matters locally. Nobody cares about that address um, on a WAN, like outside of your local network. Now, if you've got a, a, um, an address system here and you've got A wanting to send a frame to D, A will need to know the physical address of D. Now, that's very important. A will need to know the physical address of D because it's physically connected to the network here. Because the frame is used only to transmit data between nodes across a local media, the data link layer address is used only for local delivery. Addresses at this layer have no meaning beyond the local network. So this person's MAC address means something to this person. But outside of this network, it means nothing. If you're not physically connected to that network, it doesn't mean anything. Now, this might be confusing in terms of a logical point-to-point -point topology because logically, it looks like there's just two nodes. So it looks like this frame is going to go from here to here, and therefore, it will just have one set of physical addresses. But in this case, it's a bit tricky because it's not like that. There would be intermediary nodes here, and therefore there might be a router here. And remember I showed you earlier, there was a diagram somewhere here. Uh, let's see if we can just pick that one up. It seems like we have two nodes on this network, but that's logical. But physically, we see that is not the case. So that means that in order for us to uh, understand the physical addressing, we would have to look at each segment of this network. So we can see that the router to that first switch here or hub, that is, sorry, the router to this first segment here, to this next router, that would be one segment. 
and therefore they will share their own addresses. The address of the, the physical address of this router is not important to this router over here, by the way. The physical addresses are just used between the nodes. So therefore, if we're looking at, um, sorry, that uh, just keeps uh, disappearing and I'd like to show you with, uh, with, a, with another diagram. If we have a look at this network over here, this router here, its physical address and this router over here, its physical address do not mean anything to each other. We, this router here, router 5, does not care about router 1's physical address. Router 1 and router 2 are on one, are, are connected directly to each other as, as, a, as two nodes on a network. They may share each other's physical and care about each other's physical addressing. But router 2 and router 5 don't care. Router 2 and router 4, on the other hand, well, they are physically connected to each other. Therefore, we'll look at the data link uh, protocols in terms of these two routers. So that's what I'm trying to uh, get across here. And that is, logically, this is one node and this is another node and they're connected to each other. But physically, there are intermediary devices, which means there are other point-to-point -point connections. And if there are other point-to-point -point con connections, there are other protocols and source and destination physical addresses. Now, if this is getting very complicated, don't worry. All I need you to take away from this part of the uh, lecture is that um, if you are sending to a message to someone on your local network you'll need their physical address if you're on a shared or on a point-to-point -point network your device to their device that's all i need you to know right moving on right the role of the trailer now as you can see here we have the frame check sequence and this is the field used for error checking the source calculates a number based on the frame's data and places that number in the frame check sequence field. The destination then recalculates the data to see if the frame check sequence matches. If they don't match, the destination deletes the frame. The stop frame, uh, the stop frame field is also called the frame trailer, is an optional field that is used when the length of the frame is not specified in the type or length field. It indicates the end of the frame when transmitted. Now, there are other aspects to the uh, trailer, and I'd also like to just tell you that error correction, as you can see here in the trailer, is managed by both the Mac media access control as well as the logical link control. So error correction does take place in both of those sub layers of the data link, I mean the data layer. Now, we also have something called cyclic redundancy check. Now, you'll find that the cyclic redundancy check is a uh, error correction check, which what it does is it's a type of hash, hash function which produces a small fixed size checksum of a block of data. And then what we do is we then do a CRC to compute and append before we transmit. And then it's verified afterwards where, by the receiver to confirm if there were any changes that took place. Now, the cyclic redundancy check is, works in conjunction with the frame check sequence. These two, the, the uh, cyclic redundancy check is placed in the frame check sequence field. So that is where the error correction um, um, value is, is placed. Right, just having a look at the layer 2 protocols in action. Here we have a wireless protocol, a, 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 like Wi-Fi. There, there we go, 802.11. Now we've got a different protocol running, point-to-point -point protocol. Now we've got a different protocol running, HDLC. And then we're going through a, another part of the network, frame relay. And then we're coming back to the switch, and it will be Ethernet. So you can see how the data link layer can multiplex and deal with various data link layer protocols, as I said earlier on in this lecture. Now, in the header, you can see here how the Ethernet header has different uh, fields compared to a, say, wireless uh, or a point-to-point -point protocol. Can you see that the point-to-point -point protocol has got a flag, address, control, protocol, data, 
and then the frame check sequence. So this is the header, flag address control protocol, and here is the trailer frame check sequence. But if you look at the Ethernet, we can see preamble destination source type, and then the trailer frame check sequence. So you can see also look at the bytes. The fields are different sizes. Whereas if you have a look at the point-to-point uh, -point protocol, completely different, and look at the data, variable size. And if you look at, say, a wireless LAN protocol, different again. So I keep trying to bring this uh, uh, point back to you or, or, or get you to understand that different protocols require different headers and different fields. We can't expect the data link layer to use a point-to-point -point protocol when it's on an Ethernet network. And that's the beauty of the data link layer. It can deal with all these protocols and all the different hardware. Remember, point-to-point -point protocol is going to use different hardware than, say, a wireless LAN protocol. Aha. Okay, so let's sum this whole process up, including the upper layers. We've got an example here. A client needs to get data from a server. She's putting in there www.cisco.com. So that's like you doing this and you're saying uh, www.cisco.com. And then I press send or go. What's going to happen straight away is the application layer is going to be uh, called into play. Why? Because the Internet Explorer is going to deal with the application layer and it's going to then put the application layer header, the layer 7 header. And the header is simply the get request for uh, the user here in terms of the uh, Internet Explorer uh, application or software that she is using. Now we go down a layer. We go into layer 4. Layer 4 is going to attach the source port and the destination port. The uh, example here, they've already used the source port 12345, but really it'll probably be 55,422 or whatever. So for argument's sake, they, let's just say 1234. The source port is a software port. It is not a hardware port. It is a software um, port. And what happens is it is a randomly selected port that um, the TCP, I mean, that the transport layer provides in order to track the individual session. Uh, or the individual conversation, this w particular tab open will, will then be linked to this particular source port. The destination port, well, we know it. It has to be port 80 because we are attempting to get onto a web uh, server, which means the port is already defined. It has to be port 80. The transport layer knows the uh, generally used port number, so it assigns 80. It will then need acknowledgement and sequence numbers, and now we go down to the layer um, we are now still on layer 4, but what happens is we put the header here and now we go on to layer 3. Layer 3 is interested in IP addresses. This is the logical addressing of the network. And we can see that we have a source address. This is my or her address. In, in the case of my example, it would be my address. But in the case of this example, it is her. It is the sender's address. IP address is the source address. And where are you trying to get to? You're trying to get to Cisco's web server on the internet. So it is the destination address which you hopefully would have based on the DNS lookup, which you would have done, which means you will then translate www.cisco.com into an IP address with the help of a DNS server which is located on a nearby network. Right. So you've put the IP addresses. Can you see how this is getting built up with additional... Um, headers. Now we're going to layer 2. And this is what this whole lecture has been about. Can you see that I've taken this encapsulated data? Can you see there was the original data, the user www.cisco.com, encapsulated with layer 7, encapsulated with layer 4, encapsulated with IP addresses layer 3, and now framed. Look at that. Header, trailer, framing it. And there we go. What protocol are we using? What is the control access? Are we going to use CSMA CD or CSMA CA? Well, it depends on the protocol. The protocol is Ethernet, so we're going to use CD. What is the source address? This is the physical address. It is nothing to do with IP addresses. IP addresses happens on a different layer, layer 3. We are now on layer 2, so it is a physical address. It is a source address. That is my address. The destination address happens to be the next node's 
physical address. It is not the physical address of Cisco.com. Please remember I did the whole story about how they are intermediate devices. No, it is the next node's physical address. There it is. And then we need some layer 2 error information in terms of uh, uh, error correction. There's the CRC calculation and maybe the stop field. Right. Okay, they're just going to more details here. Now we are ready to send. Can you see an encoding is taking place? The frame is sent to the physical layer and is literally pumped onto the uh, medium or me onto the media and it happens to be well they've put your 10 base but nowadays we would use a gigabit ethernet so it happens to be ethernet and there we go it is put onto a carrier and sent on into the network it gets to this first node the first node picks it up physically means bits are being uh, um, uh, uh, received and then it takes it to the data link layer. The data link layer looks for error correction, looks for the source and destination physical addresses, looks at the protocol, and now it is going to get it ready to transmit uh, over the other interface on this router. Remember, this happens to be Ethernet, and this is the beauty of the data link layer. Look at that. On the other side of the router, check it out, it's changing the protocol, different protocol, different addressing, it's going to remove the encapsulated layer, uh, layer uh, the encapsulated layer two data, and put on new layer uh, two um, frame uh, headers and trailers. It now needs to put new IP addressing. Layer three, it will have to deal with, and that's why it's called the logical link because it now needs to allow layer three to have access to a different media therefore it has to interface with layer three to get the addressing and there we go and we continue uh, it gets sent on the network it does some error correction boom there it gets sent look at that the layer one uh, uh, um, f uh, additional um, headers there and it gets finally to the router nearby cisco the uh, CRC is done. The layer two uh, headers are now and the, uh, the trailers are removed. And then it goes to the network layer. We now are on the layer of IP addresses. And now we are trying to locate the IP address of Cisco.com, which happened to be the 192.168, the, the DNS resolved address. And remember that layer three is the layer of routing. So it will now forward that uh, a packet and now I'm saying packet because we're dealing with layer 3. It will now forward that to the next uh, uh, node. And there we go. It's going to the server. The server will also have a MAC address because remember, don't forget, this is still a local network. And in order for this router and this node to talk to each other, they still have to have data link layer protocols. So now they are still using Ethernet once again, and therefore it is the MAC address, source address, and uh, the uh, protocol, CSMA, CD. And there you can see the process is repeated. It's a similar process that happened on this side is now happening on this side using a similar protocol. While it were, when it was on the WAN, it used a different protocol although still on the data link layer. And then there's encoding and so forth. All right, coming to the server, the server now gets it, processes the error correction data, <laughs> looks at the source and destination MAC address, look at the source MAC physical address. Once the <clears throat> frame is at the server, the source um, physical address or source MAC address happens to be this router's MAC address. Do you get that? It's not this router's MAC address. No, it's node to node. That's where the data link layer works. Node to node. Layer 3, it works logically. There to there. You understand? Okay. And then it processes it. Uh, um, I'm going to step through these quite quickly. And then it looks at the IP address of the uh, sender, you can see the source IP address happens to be her. The destination IP address happens to be the server. And you can see how logically these two nodes are now connected 
but physically it's not true. Physically they went through various intermediary devices, but logically we need just the sender and the receiver's address, but logically there are a lot of uh, intermediary devices and uh, physical addresses along the route. All right, and then eventually the um, GET request is now moving up the OSI layers on in the server and eventually to the application layer which will then interface with the web server software of Cisco. And that sums up the process. Thanks for watching. I hope this was helpful. Cheers.